speaker is Lachlan Colley. Pronounce that properly. I, uh, Lachlan is a, an undergraduate student from the School of Mining Engineering who will present to us his project on uh, selective laser sintering in situ in space. Thank you, Lachlan. No worries. Uh, so, as I was introduced, my name is Lachlan Colley. I just finished my undergrad degree in mining engineering and geology, so I'm not really aerospace related. But for my thesis, I basically looked at selective laser sintering on the moon, basically, um, as my topic. So the way I went about doing this was in two ways. I did a lot of background research, but I realized in doing that, that most sort of space research is done just in that way, purely theoretical. And I decided to then also go about making a selective laser sense, uh, system and then use it with a ceramic feedstock and see how this would work. Um, so yeah, there's also a very practical component to this, um, and I'll discuss that later. So this has been covered numerous times in the last two days, I'll just gloss over it, but basically in situ resource utilization will be absolutely critical if we are to become a space range species and to really sort of maximize our potential within the solar system and beyond. So yeah, I won't cover that too much because it's already been covered. Basically, um, I discovered as well that off-Earth mining will be fundamentally different to how it exists on Earth. So where you have things like belt transfer points, processing plants, uh, mining trucks, haul trucks, all the rest of it, as very sort of separate isolated entities, in the space setting, they really do need to be fully integrated and you need to be able to not only uh, mine and process the material, but create usable products all in one sort of smooth uh, sort of system. And that is really critical to sort of enable this. So some studies have been done into this, but once again, as I said, mostly theoretical stuff. So basically, International Space Station is a great example. It was assembled in space, not manufactured in space. But as of December last year, there was an attempt by Maiden Space Industries, which was mentioned earlier today actually, to actually uh, 3D print a uh, ratcheting socket wrench. So it was done using fused deposition modeling, which is basically where you have a 3D filament, which is uh, extruded through a heated element, and then it basically just sticks to itself. Very similar to how a hot glue gun works, if you know how they work. Um, but yeah, very sort of basic technology. If you ever go buy a commercial 3D printer just off the shelf at the moment, this is exactly the technology you get. This one had been modified slightly, but basically it's exactly the same. So I looked at selective laser sintering in particular, and this has existed since about the 80s. Uh, originally it was a DARPA-sponsored project from the States, and it came out of the University of Texas at Austin with uh, Dr. Carl Decker. He was really sort of the driving force behind it. And it's quite a unique technology in that it is an additive manufacturing technique and offers a lot of flexibility, not only the materials, but the actual material properties you would get at the very end. So basically how it works is, in a nutshell, you put down a thin layer of powder, you melt it with a laser into whatever uh, shape you want, say a circle, for example. You then put down a second layer, melt that with a la uh, laser, and those two layers fuse to each other. And you literally do this hundreds if not thousands of times and eventually build up a shape layer by layer. So with the example I just gave of the circle, if you did that thousands of times, you'd end up with a cylinder. And you can really then do incredibly complex internal geometries and things like that. So these are just some examples of what are being done commercially at the moment. Uh, on the left there, you've got an optimized cooling structure in a mold, uh, which is used to make plastic cups. Uh, biomedical applications are also very good. There's actually a bone growth structure there, uh, EOS did with one of their implants, which actually promotes bone growth into the actual uh, uh, sort of so uh, hip socket, uh, socket there. Um, and that's the kind of thing this is really sort of geared up towards doing. Really one-off specialized things, but you could also do mass produced parts. Um, Current Exec, who are a sports car manufacturer, their variable geometry turbos are currently made using this technology and the Super Draco rocket motor's main oxidizer valve is made using this technology. So commercially, it is finding applications, but it's really sort of the high end of engineering. So basically for my thesis then, I went to the practical side, and I was like, well, how hard can it be to make one of these things? And it turns out, very hard. So <laughs> laser and CNC control, I decided was one thing I needed to sort of get sorted very quickly. That could be basically an X and Y axis. I then decided I needed a build chain, which basically gave me the Z axis control, and also the powder as a feedstock. So they were the three sort of, I suppose, fundamental things I worked out I needed. So basically I went about collecting all the parts. I had designed a build chamber from scratch. I got some parts machined. That was a learning experience. As a mining engineer, that was really uncharted territory. Uh, CNC control electronics, once again, I had to teach myself from scratch. So that was quite hard to do, but it just sort of proves if you have your mind set on doing something and you've got six months to kill, you can definitely do it. Um, <laughs> buying the laser, that was this fairly dodgy Chinese laser, but it worked in the end, so that's all right. And the power I sourced from a number of mines I actually worked at, a uh, power station with some fly ash, and really, really interestingly, I managed to get my hands on some Australian lunar simulant, which I'll come back to in a second. So basically, here's the process in my parents' basement. That's great. Putting it all together. So it, yeah, really took like all the best bit of six months, and I was overloading the subjects at uni as well. So it was quite a challenge. Um, but yeah, there's the final result there. So I had all the control electronics wired up, build a custom table, cut the bottom out of the laser, put the build chamber in, 
and she was ready to go. So then I had to go about getting the powders, as I said. Uh, the key one there being the top one, the Australia Linus Simulant. Uh, that was made by Dr. Leonard Bernholt, uh, I think about two or three years ago now, at the University of New South Wales. And basically, it roughly, uh, chemically and size-wise, uh, sort of is an analogous material to that that's found on the moon. It does have a glutinous and some of the razor-sharp particles in it, because it is naturally from uh, like Australia. Um, and because of that, it's been weathered, because it's just a basalt powder, really. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not the best simulant, but it's very good compared to a lot of other things. Um, the other one there to notice is the fly ash. Uh, that was the one I had the best results with, but I'll come back in a second. So just some bulk densities there, nothing too special. All you really need to look at is the round one. Uh, these weren't packed down, but these did have some sort of implications for my final system parts. Just once again, looking at how they sort of size distribution worked out, the flash and the ALS, which I had sort of the two best results with, had a very uh, fine powder distribution, uh, and that can be seen here. Around sort of 45 microns, about 90 micron with the fly ash. Um, and yeah, I got this really nice spread actually, and that was just a fluke. I didn't even plan for that, it just sort of happened that way. So yeah. Um, so moving on, I actually tested it. And this was really the coup de grace moment. I, up to this point, didn't even know if the system would even work at all. And so I got all the powders lined up and actually applied the laser to them. And I actually managed to create these little sort of glass beads, essentially. Um, as you notice with the ALS and the shale there, there's kind of a sputtering or kind of like a dispersion of the actual powder. And I think in the case of the shale, that was due to the organic content. It was actually sort of combusting. Uh, in the ALS, I think that's actually moisture, but I'm not 100% sure. Still, so that's just my like, uh, hypothesis. So just to sort of confirm that the ALS was indeed a rather good, uh, I suppose, analogous material to that that is found on the moon, I actually looked at the actual vitreous glass beads that were created, and they actually looked very, very, very similar to those uh, on actual Apollo um, regolith. So that just kind of confirmed that I was kind of on the right track here, and was sort of doing something that was somewhat scientifically accurate. So then I went forward and actually created some 2D shapes. Um, once again, these are 10 by 10 millimeters. Um, I had a line spacing of about 200 microns, so 0.2 millimeters. The focus of my laser wasn't that great, because like I said, it was this really dodgy Chinese laser, and it was, yeah, all a bit how you going. But in the end, I did manage to create these shapes. Really, the only ones that worked were the fly ash and the Sydney sand. Uh, and I hypothesized this is due largely to my low powered laser, laser, about 40 watts, and that they had a very, very high silica content. And this high silica content basically <coughs> did no bones reactivity series as a geologist. That's kind of what I was to work with. But basically, silicates are the first to melt, so they melt at the lower temperatures, around sort of six to sort of 800 degrees Celsius. Uh, obviously, if you get hotter than that, it will definitely melt. Um, whereas the ALS, being a basaltic composition and being mafic, basically has a lot more ions and magnesium, which melts at much higher temperatures, of around sort of 1500 degrees. And I simply could not achieve that with my low powered laser. So then from there, I decided to just pursue the flash in the Sydney sand to see if I could create a 3D part. And so there's a Sydney sand there, just with the 2D parts. These are very, very weak, um, probably similar in strength like a cornflake. Um, it's probably the best analogy I can come up with. So if you tried, it doesn't take very much and you can break them. But they did sort of support their own weight. Um, yeah. So then basically, this was like for me the greatest thing in the world because six months of engineering and going through forums online and trying to fix things I've broken sort of culminated in actually creating this 3D part. And so this is with the fly ash, which like I said, just sort of had the sort of best melting characteristics of any of the materials I looked at. Um, as you can see there, between the layers, there was not a lot of liquid phase sintering going on. And the actual, I suppose, Z-axis layering really did mean it was definitely not strongest in the Z-axis and they would delaminate quite easily. Um, this component here, uh, which was a one centimeter cube, had a strength uh, probably comparable to like a puffed rice cereal or like a piece of, I suppose, popcorn. It's kind of not really spongy, but if you squeeze it, you can definitely crush it. Um, yeah, so that's basically what I created. So it did prove that you can do all this research, which does have some kind of gravity with a very, very little budget. We did have some issues here. Control system errors uh, with the cheap Chinese laser. Pumping and streaking the moisture control. In hindsight, that's one thing I focused on, but I didn't know at the time. Uh, and hand spreading. I just could not get the Z-axis to work. Uh, and that was just due to the time. Um, so basically, the conclusions were, in situ resource civilization would be key. Uh, basically, high silicon materials are really similar to this process, but they do produce a vitreous sort of product. And basically, you can do very, very cost effective research. I was basically self funded, I had a little bit of help from the university, but the majority of it was my own money. And it was about 3,000 Australian dollars I spent on it. And yeah, it kind of worked. Um, finally, basically, moving on from here, using a high powered laser to get better results, basically. I reckon with a budget of roughly 20,000 Australian dollars, you could produce results probably comparable to like, commercial systems that sell from a million dollars upward. Um, so that was really interesting to find out. 
Uh, additionally, you can also use this technology to make molds and then do something like lost wax casting or something like that to then make a part. So you don't have to use this to directly make parts. Uh, and additionally, I'd also look at the ChemCam on the Mars Science Laboratory, which is actually firing lasers on the surface of Mars at the moment. So there might be some interesting results there, which may have some implications in that And that's pretty much it. So thank you. So center spheres, I'll start with those, they're basically byproducts of when you burn coal, similar to the fly ash, um, but they're basically just really small glass beads that naturally form when you have such a high temperature environment. Uh, the chemistry though, I didn't actually get time. I wanted to actually run an XRF analysis on most of these, uh, but I simply ran out of time, and like I said, I was struggling just to get the whole system to work. Uh, but that is definitely something that could be looked into in the future moving forward. Just to expand on that, um, yeah, definitely. Well, that's the other thing. You can also apply this technology if you've got it perfected to terrestrial mines. So you'd rock it to a mine instead of importing all this metal, you could actually build your infrastructure there. And it doesn't matter if you have to over-engineer it, the material's not costing you anything. Um, and yeah, basically all you need is electricity, and that's it, so yeah. But um, yeah, you're definitely looking for those other features as well. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? Oh, yep. did, did you really say that you were working in a practice basis? Yeah, literally. I had um, minimal support from the school because it wasn't really a mining thesis as much as it was a material science and mechanical engineering thesis. So everywhere I would write about this, I'd kind of shoehorn the term mining in. And I'd be like, oh, that's all right then. But um, yeah, it was really sort of limited support, so I had to do a lot of it on my own. Um, but yeah, like I said, one of the things I wanted to prove is that you can do very meaningful research on a very, very limited budget. Uh, which I, I feel I did. So, yes. yeah. And I have to say, all of the students who are presenting here and all of our students really are working on tiny budgets and managing to produce very high-class work. So, uh, well done. Thank you. Um, John, thank you all. Cheers. Thank you.